Let's uh, bow our heads and uh, close our eyes in prayer. Father God, with uh, every head bowed and every eye closed, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we are able to see and hear this morning. We are able to see your word as we read it, and we are able to hear your word as it is brought to us. And Father, we are so blessed because you are forgiving and understanding God. And Father, we ask that you will forgive us this day for everything that we've done, everything that we've said, and everything that went against the word of God. Right now, we ask you for your forgiveness. And Father, we ask that you would keep us safe from all danger and all harm. And Father, we ask you that you would let us start this day with a new attitude and plenty of gratitude, Father. And Father, we ask you to let us be the best that we can be in every day to clear our minds so that we can hear from you. And Father, we ask that you would let us not whine and whimper over things that we have no control over. And let us continue to see sin, Father, through your eyes and acknowledge it as evil. And if we do sin, Father, let us repent and let us confess with our mouth our wrongdoing and receive the forgiveness of God. And Father, when this world closes in on us, let us remember Jesus' example and slip away and find a quiet place to pray. And Father, we know that when we can't pray, you listen to our hearts. And Father, we ask that you will continue to bless us so that we can be a blessing to others. And Father, we pray for those that are lost and can't find their way. And we pray for those that are misjudged and misunderstood. And Father, we pray for those who don't have a relationship with your son, Jesus. And we pray for those who don't believe. And we thank you that we do believe. And Father, we pray that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart is be pleasing in your sight. Father, this is our prayer. In Jesus' name, our Lord our Savior, and our God. Amen. I uh, want to talk about something this morning that I truly believe that the people that was hear this DVD really need to hear this in these last days. And I think that uh, it's always good for us as Christians to hear this again and again and again so that our faith would be energized with this truth that I'm getting ready to talk about. And I'm going to discuss life after death. And the title of this message is, Is There a Life After Death? Now, the existence of life after death, that's like a universal question. And this is a question that I'm sure that a lot of us have asked ourselves, even before you was a Christian or after you became a Christian, this question has probably popped up in your mind at one time or another. Is there a life after death? Now, I think Job speaks for us when he stated that a man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He springs up like a flower and withers away. Like a fleeting shadow, he does not endure. Now, that can be found in Job 14, verses 1 and 2. So the question is, if a man dies, will he live again? So just like Job, we've been challenged with that question. If a man dies, will he live again? Now, let's just say that you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You're a non-believer. Now, here are some questions that you may ask yourself or you may ask somebody else. You may ask exactly uh, what happens after we die. Or you may ask, do we simply cease to exist? Or you may ask, do we all go to the same place after we die? Or do we go to different places after we die? And one of the big questions that a non-believer may ask, is there really a heaven? And is there really a hell? Now, we're going to see what God has to say about it. The Bible tells us that there is not only life after death, but there is 
eternal life. I mean, there is, there is eternal life so glorious, so glorious that it says in Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 2, verse 9, that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and it had not even entered the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, meditate on that, that scripture for a minute. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. It has not entered the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, did you catch the end of that scripture? God has prepared for those who love him. Now, a lot of times that scripture has been misunderstood. I misunderstood it. Because I used to think that when I read that, that, I read that scripture, that God was talking about everybody. He's not talking about everybody. He's not talking about everybody there. Because he knows that there are people in this world that don't love him. Matter of fact, there are people in this world that despise the Lord. When Jesus was walking around on the face of the earth, there were people that despised him. It ain't changed. There are people still that despise the Lord. And he knew the discourse was, was, was going to come about. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you don't love him, ain't nothing being prepared for you in the kingdom of God. Nothing. Now, there is something that's being prepared for those that don't love him, but I can guarantee you it's not in the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus said in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life because he knew that this question was going to come about. See, that's how far God has thought ahead of us. His thinking is higher than ours. He answered the question before we could even ask it. So how does a person know when he truly loves God? Well, if we accepted what Jesus did for us on that cross and we've accepted him as our personal Savior, we love him. If we've repented of our sins and did a 180, and I'm not talking about a 360, because if you do a 360, you're still continuing on in your sins. I'm talking about a 180. Repent of your sins and ask God to forgive you. You love him. Now, don't we communicate with the ones we love? Rick, don't you communicate with Missy? Because you love her. Frank, you communicate with Linda? Because you love her. Floyd, you communicate with Michelle? Because you love her. So, if we love Jesus, we're going to communicate with him. And the way we're going to communicate with him is by reading this word, which is, by the way, is his way of communicating with us. And when we talk to God through prayer, that's our way of communicating with him. See, these are the things that you do to somebody that you love. Now, if we don't read this word, you know, and pastor's always telling us that we need to get into this word on a day-to-day -day basis. But if we don't read this word, we have no interest in pleasing God at all. We don't have no interest in, in pleasing him if we don't read this word. And if we're not interested in pleasing him, Christ, we have no interest in pleasing the Father. You can't please the Father unless you please the Son. And furthermore, if we don't have interest in pleasing him, we don't love Christ and we don't love God. All we are doing is deceiving ourselves. That's the bottom line. That's what we're doing is deceiving ourselves. Now, Jesus Christ, which is God in the flesh, he came to this earth to give us a gift. And that gift is eternal life. 
That's why he came, to give us eternal life. Because the Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 5, that he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. So Jesus took a punishment that he shouldn't have taken. That punishment should have been ours. But see, he didn't do this for himself. He did it for us because he loved us. That's why he sacrificed himself on that cross for our sins. When he did that, then what happened? I'll tell you what happened. Three days later, three days later, he proved himself victorious over death by raising up from the grave. And, and he remained on this earth for over 40 days, and he was witnessed by hundreds of people. Witnessed by hundreds of people before he ascended into heaven to be with the Father. Now Romans 4.25 says, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Wow. Live, delivered over to death for our sins and raised up to life for our justification so that we would be justified in our life. He did all this for us, not for himself. You see, we had eternal life in the garden. We had it in the garden. But when Adam fell, Jesus had to come and make it right with God again for us. Because God, he created us to be eternal beings. So don't think for a moment that when you die, that's it. Because that ain't it. Death is not the end. Is there life after death? Death is not the end. Now, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's a, a well-documented event. A well-documented event because the Apostle Paul, he challenged people. Challenged people to go and ask the witness. Go over there and ask this guy over here. This really happened. Go ask this guy over here. This really happened. And there was not one person, not one, that could test, that could contest the truth of that resurrection. Not one. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's the cornerstone of our belief. That's the cornerstone. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we can have faith and believe that we are also going to be raised from the dead too. Because the resurrection of Christ is the ultimate proof, the ultimate proof that there is life after death. And Christ was only the first of a great harvest of those that are going to be raised from the dead. You know, each one of you, each one of you that's believing, each one of you that's listening to this DVD that's a believer is going to be part of that great harvest. One day, you also are going to be raised from the dead. Because physical death came through one man, Adam. And each and every one of us is related to Adam. Physical death is going to come up on each and every one of us unless the rapture comes and takes us up out of here. Now, when we are adopted into God's family through faith in Jesus Christ, that's when the new life begins. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 22, but the fact is that Christ, which is the Messiah, has been raised from the dead, and he became the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep in death. For since it was through one man, 
that death came into this world, also through a man the re resurrection of the dead has come. For just as because of their union of nature in Adam, all people die. And also by virtue of their union of nature shall all in Christ be made alive. One man caused death. One man is going to cause everlasting life, which is Jesus Christ. And just as God raised up Jesus' body, he's going to do the same thing for us at the return of Jesus Christ. You see, God's going to do what he did for his son for each believer on the face of the earth. Not just in Charleston, but everywhere, all over this earth. There's a whole lot of people, you know, like mediums and things like that, that they say they talk to the dead, where well, they claim they talk to the dead. But I come by here to tell you this morning, the dead can't take care of themselves. What does the dead know about the life of the living? Nothing. Because life don't come from non-life. Jesus is life. That's where life comes from. He's the author of life. That's why salvation is a whole lot of grace. A whole lot of grace. Because we, as human beings, we are incapable of saving ourselves. We have to have a savior. We can't save ourselves. We couldn't save ourselves. That's why it says in Romans 6, 23, that for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift of God. It's free. All you got to do is believe in here. That's all you got to do is believe in here. It's free. Because man is sinfully dead. Man is spiritually dead until he accepts Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. There are so many people walking around the face of this earth right now. They think they're alive, but they're spiritually dead. They are sinfully dead. They so deep in their sins, it's crazy. Because they have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, even though we're all going to be resurrected, but everybody's not going to go to heaven. Remember that question? About where we're going to go? Are we going to go to different places? Everybody's not going to go to heaven because each person on the face of this earth has to make a choice. God gave us the right to choose. So we have to make a choice. And that choice is going to determine what our destination is going to be. That choice is going to determine whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. Now here's what the Bible says in uh, Hebrews 9, verse 27. And just as it, as it is appointed for all, not one, but all men wants to die. And after that, the judgment. Now, after that, the judgment. That judgment is certain. Not possible judgment. Not, I think I'm going to be judged. Uh-uh. It's certain judgment. Because the Bible says that. I'll give you a little example. There's a, a program called Scared Straight. And I know a lot of y'all have done heard of this. Now, this pro program is the natural. And this is where they put the fear of man. Put the fear of man into you and tell you all the bad things that can happen to you if you end up in jail doing your rebellion. Okay? Now that's the natural side. Now what about the spiritual side? Shouldn't we be scared straight when it comes to the Lord? Shouldn't we? Amen? Let's say that you, you get life in jail for some crime that you commit. 
Let's just say it's murder. We'll, we, we'll say that. Now, that life sentence that you got in jail, that's temporary. That's temporary time. But let's say that during that life sentence, you die in jail. Now, that spirit leaves your body. You just entered into the eternal realm of life. If you weren't serving Jesus Christ or had repented of your sins while you was in jail, in your heart, you're going to hell. But if you repented of your sins and God can look at your heart and say, oh, this person has did that 180, he's going to forgive you and you're going to heaven. So we should be scared straight of God instead of being scared straight of man. Because man can't really do nothing to you. Man can't even kill you. Because that spirit is going to leave, he can kill this body, but that spirit is going to leave this body, and it's going to go somewhere. It's going to either go to heaven or it's going to go to hell. See, God got control over the spirit. Man don't have control over the spirit. He can control that body. He can kill that body. That body can die. But that spirit is going to live throughout eternity. What I'm saying is, those who have been made righteous through faith in Christ is going to have an eternal life in heaven. But those who reject Christ as Savior, they're going to be sent to eternal punishment in hell. Bottom line. Because a lot of folks, I used to do this, a lot of folks are... They are measuring themselves by themselves. I used to do that, measure myself by my standards. But the Bible tells us not to do that because if you do that, you're not being wise. You see, the one who commends himself is not approved. But if God commends you, then you approve. So we have to stop measuring ourselves by ourselves or stop measuring ourselves by somebody else's standards. We need to measure ourselves by these standards right here if we want to be approved. Now, heaven and hell. Is heaven and hell just a state of existence? No. These are two real places. Just like this church is a building and your house is another building, that's the way heaven and hell is. These are two real places. They're not just a state of existence. Heaven, I mean, hell is a place where there are righteous is going to uh, experience never ending eternal wrath from God. Never ending. From eternity to eternity to eternity. That's forever. This is how the Bible describes hell in Revelation 9. Verse 1, it says, Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. And the angel was given the key of the shaft of the abyss, or the bottomless pit. And sometimes it's called the lake of fire, burning with sulfur, where the inhabitants will be tormented day and night, forever and ever and ever. I don't want to go to a place like that. But well, matter of fact, I ain't going to a place like that. Matthew 13, verse 42 explains, hell is a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, to me, that indicates that there's a lot of grief and a whole lot of anger there. People are mad at God. They're in grief because they didn't do what they were supposed to do when they were supposed to do it. When they had a chance to do the right thing, they didn't. So that's what's going to be going on there. And a lot of people uh, wonder, I've heard people say, well, do we get a second chance to follow Christ after death? <laughs> well, let's talk about that. You know, now that sounds appealing. That sounds very appealing, a second chance. But the Bible makes it very clear that this is not an option. 
It's not an option. Let's use this example that's found in Luke 16, verse 26. Now, this is when Jesus uh, speaks about the afterlife of, of Lazarus. And he says, and besides all this between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from here to there. Now that tells me in Jesus' own words very clearly that there is not a second chance, ain't no option. Because when you make that decision, changing your eternal destiny in the afterlife, that's it. That decision is final. Because once you made the decision not to follow Christ upon death, whatever decision that you done made, which is the other way, that's the final decision. That's what's going to happen. It says in Philippians 2, verse 10 through 11, that at the end of time, that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You see, one day everybody that opposes Jesus is going to bow before him. Every knee, not just will bow, every knee must bow. Those knees that don't want to bend, oh, they're going to bend. They're going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. I mean, those people that don't want to talk about Christ, they're going to frankly and openly confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That tongue ain't going to want to speak that, but it's coming out. They're going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But at that time, the situation that they're in, they can't change it. Ain't no second chance. After death, all that remains for an unbeliever is judgment. That's it. It's judgment. Remember when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you? Well, Jesus is not preparing a place in heaven for those who oppose him. Trust me. And because of their contempt for him, they're going to remain separated from Christ throughout eternity. That's a bad place to be. That's why we have to trust in the Lord in this life. In this life. You know, there's a song that says, people get ready. People get ready. There's a train coming. You don't need no ticket. You just get on board. There's a train coming. Jesus Christ is the conductor of that train. And Jesus Christ is going to be standing at the door. And he's going to be saying, my good and faithful servant, you go this way. I didn't know you, you go this way. My good and faithful servant, go this way. I didn't know you, you go this way. Mama, my good and faithful servant, you go this way. Rick, my good and faithful servant, you go this way. Debbie, my good and faithful servant, you go this way. You, yeah, I'm talking to you that's listening to this DVD right now. What's he going to tell you? My good and faithful servant, go this way? Or is he going to tell you, I didn't know you go this way? The choice is yours. In other words, the ball is in your court. I want to hear those words, my good and faithful servant, go this way. Because the train is coming. The Bible says in Job 14, verse 10, but man dies and is laid low. He breathes his last and is no more. I don't see a second chance there. I don't see a second chance there. You only live one time in this body, in the natural. One time. And when you take your last breath, if you're an unbeliever, that's it. No second chances. But for believers, your last breath here 
is your first breath with Jesus Christ throughout eternity. You can believe that. You can hang your head on that. But I want to say that the understanding that we have as Christian folks to know Jesus Christ, what we need to do is urgently and passionately share the gospel with those people that we know who don't know Christ. That's one thing that we, we are charged to do that. And if you're paying attention to this teaching, this teaching should cause some people that are uncertain about the decisions that they make for their salvation. This teaching should help them go into the right direction. It says in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, it says, examine and test and evaluate your own self to see whether you are holding to your faith and showing the proper fruits of it. Test and prove yourself. Do you not yourselves realize that and know that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are counterfeits, disapproved, on trial, and rejected? So we need to test ourselves. Don't test Christ because you can't test Christ. Test yourself. Test yourself and see if you're living right. Test yourself and see if you don't repented of your sin. Test yourself and see if you read the word like you're supposed to read the word. Test yourself and see if you're coming to church like you're supposed to come to church. Test yourself and see if you're doing the right thing with your neighbor and, and, and your husband or your wife. Test yourself. Don't test Christ. Because choosing our eternal destiny is something that we can't put off later on in life. I heard people say, well, when I get older, then I'll turn to Jesus Christ. Or... When I turn 50 or 60 or 70, then I turn to Jesus Christ. Well, that's fine too. But the Lord says, today is the day of salvation. Because you don't know how long you're going to live. Babies are dying. So today is the day of salvation. You can't put this off till you get older. You got to do it now. Each and every one of us, we, are so, we should be so grateful that we are in the arms of the Lord and we know where our uh, eternal destiny is going to be. We should be so grateful that God waited on us and that he was patient for us to do that 180. You know, how many times have each one of us if we just would be honest with ourselves, had the chance to accept the Lord. I mean, I know there's a lot of time. I can testify to that. There's been a lot of times that we all have had a chance to do that 180-degree turn. Now, Abraham told Lazarus in Luke 16, verse 31, that if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither would they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Well, what do we got? We got scripture, and we got the res resurrection of Jesus. We got that. And it's true. We got it. Now, to me, that's enough evidence for me to accept Jesus Christ in my life and have salvation. That's enough for me. Because once this life is over, once this life is over, there are no second chances. Because today is the day of salvation. You know, a lot of wicked folk die and this and that. And a lot of people think that God takes pleasure in the death of the wicked. He don't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. See, what God wants the wicked to do is to turn their life around so they can live. That's what he wants them to do, so they can live. But there's one thing that God won't do. He will not force us to submit to him. I think that's an awesome God. He will not force us to submit to him. If you choose to reject God, 
He's going to let you go your way. Now, that don't mean that he's not going to stop tugging at you or the Holy Spirit is not going to stop tugging at you, but he's not going to force you to submit to him. He gives you the right to choose. Because this life that we're living on this earth, this ain't nothing but a test. It's just a test. This life that we're living should be in preparation for what's to come. That's what we should be doing. So as believers, life after death is eternal life in heaven with God. For unbelievers, life after death is eternity in lake of fire. In other words, total separation from God. So, somebody may ask, how can we receive life after death and avoid eternity in the lake of fire? Well, I come by here this morning to tell you. The only way you can do it is through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Jesus said in John 11, verse 25 through 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Eternal life is a free gift. And it's not only available to me and to you. It's available to everybody on the face of the earth. Everybody. Because God don't show partiality. He wants everybody to have the same thing, eternal life. And our eternal destination is determined in our earthly lifetimes by our acceptance or by our refusal to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2 tells us that I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Not the next day. Not till we get older. But now. Today. Sunday. Now. And if we trusted the death of Jesus as our full payment for our sin against God, and we are guaranteed not only a meaningful life on this earth, but also eternal life after death in the glorious presence of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Now, to me, that's not caught between a rock and a hard place. That's in a wonderful place to be. I met people, and I'm sure you have too, that they won't even talk about death. They won't. You know why? Because they don't know what the finality is going to be. They know they're going to die. But they don't know what's going to happen after death. And another reason they don't talk about death is because they don't want to confront their sins. That's why they don't talk about it. And then there are those people who are worried about life after death. They worried about life after death because they don't know what's going to happen either. But me? Mm -mm. I ain't worried about life after death. My concern is life before death. See, if I live my life for Christ before death, I don't have to worry about life after death. Now, if I spend my life bite batting, bite, uh, backbiting, gossiping, uh, stealing, and robbing folks, and doing everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, I got to worry about life after death. But if I spend my life believing that Jesus Christ died on that cross for my sins, if I spend my life believing that Jesus Christ rose on the third day, if I spend my life believing that Jesus Christ is ascended into heaven and is seated at the right-hand side of the Father, and if I spend my life believing that he's going to come back just in the same manner that he left here, I ain't got to worry about life after death. Because life after death has been taken care of for me. I ain't got to worry about it. Woo! Uh, 
Uh, what do you think Jesus said he was going to prepare, to prepare a place for us? He said that because he knew one day we was going to die. And those that believed in him, he was going to prepare a place for them so they could be with him forever and ever and ever. Jesus also said in Mark 8, verse 36, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Now, there's people in this world that got a whole lot of money. They got houses all over the world. They can drive a different car for every day of the month. They can pay people to kill people. They can do anything just about that they want to do. You might say they got the world in their hand. But those same people, ain't none of them going to church. Those same people, ain't none of them tithing. Those same people, they're not trying to help the poor. They got all this money, but they're so selfish, and they're doing everything that they want to do for themselves. So that's what God is saying. What good is all this money and all this stuff that you got if you lose your soul? It ain't, ain't no good, because when you die, you're going to know who's going to spend your money anyway. The Bible says that life is but a breath. So our very next breath could be the end. Life is but a breath. So we have to be prepared. We have to get ready. Life is but a breath. Now we can debate this subject right here that I'm talking about from one end of the earth to the, to the other. We can debate this subject until you turn blue in the face. But the core message of what the Bible says that happens after death cannot and should not be debated. The bottom line is that you're going to, as believers, we're going to spend eternity with Jesus in the new heaven and the new earth as described in Revelation 21 and 22. Those who don't believe or unbelievers will spend eternity in the lake of fire as described in Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. You don't want to be without Christ. You don't want to be without Christ. I don't want to be without Christ. I was talking to Landy a few weeks back, and Landy always gives me uh, reading material, and it's really helped me a lot with my grief since the passing of my wife. And we were talking, and uh, I was telling Landy that when Martha and I first got together, and we started dating, I just fell in love with her. And she wasn't somebody that I just wanted to be with. She was somebody that I didn't want to be without. That's the way I feel about Christ, but more so. I don't want to be without Jesus. You don't want to be without Jesus. You listening to this DVD, you don't want to be without Jesus. If you're without Jesus, you need to get him into your life. When we talk about life after death, sometimes we try to separate that life from this life, and we missed the whole point. We missed the whole point. You see, the life experiences that we have today determines our eternity tomorrow. That's why Jesus said for us to lay up treasures in heaven and not on the face of this earth, because all this stuff is temporary. Lay up treasures in heaven. That's where eternity is. Because you can't say who you are until you know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, you can't say who you are. I can say who I am. You can say who you are because we're all going to heaven. But if you don't know Christ, you can't say who you are. 
because you don't know where you're going. You know, sometimes we act a fool and God still blesses us. You know? And we act a fool a little bit more. And God still blesses us. So we act a fool some more. And God still blesses us. Now, God ain't encouraging us to act a fool. That's not what he's doing. But he's blessing us to show us that he's God. And we have to realize that. So how much more would he bless us if we stop acting the fool? <laughs> you know? So Jesus said in John 8, 51, that I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. So if you will follow Christ and you plan on dying, you're going to be disappointed. He just, I just read it. He said, you'll never see death. Now, the Bible says in Psalm 6, verse 5, that no one remembers you when, you when he is dead. Who praises you from the grave? That's talking to the Lord. No one remembers you, Father, when he is dead. Who praises you from the grave? Nobody. You got to do it in this life. You got to praise God now. Today is the day of salvation. We have to believe in this word right here and put our feelings to the side. Because there's one thing you can't do. You can't go through hell to get to heaven. You can only go through Jesus Christ to get to heaven. And the choice is ours. So, who are you going to choose today? Are you going to choose Jesus? Or are you going to choose the world and all its temporary possessions? Who are you going to choose? The Lord says choose life. I choose Jesus. I choose Jesus. You see, Jesus Christ is the beginning of my end. I choose Jesus. The most evil thing that a person can do, in my belief, the most evil thing that a person can do in life is turn away from God. That's the most evil thing that a person can do is turn away from God. So, choose Jesus. Get on the right track. And in closing, I'm going to leave you with this. The Lord said it. I believe it, and that sells it. Enough said. Thank you. Everybody stand to your feet, please. Everybody stand, please. Before we get dismissed, we're gonna, I want to pray. Father God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the word, Father. And Father, as we leave this building, and as we go out to our homes or out to dinner or wherever our destination may be, Father, we ask that you would allow the angels of heaven to come down and put a hedge of protection around each and every one of us, Father, throughout this day and throughout the time that you have allotted us to be here on this earth. And Father, we choose you today. We choose to serve you, the almighty God, the creator of everything. We choose you, and we thank you right now, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, for all that you've done for us, for all that you will do for us. We thank you right now. In Jesus' name, our Lord, our Savior, and our God. Amen.